Scream is a perfect slasher film. It is about the best that has ever been produced on a purely technical level. Was until 2018's Halloween, the highest grossing slasher film ever made, and has since its creation been the bar standard of the level of excellence on which this type of thing should, or at least could be done. If you somehow clicked on this and don't know what the Scream franchise is, they are essentially stylized Agatha Christie style whodunit murder mysteries. Every movie has a new ghost face killer, and we're introduced to a cast of characters mixed with some familiar faces that we already know, and then are asked, which one did it? Which one of these people is the killer? There's a more violent flair to them than your typical run-of-the-mill murder mysteries. They have more excitement geared towards action horror, but at the end of the day, their differences from something like Murder, She Wrote is actually kind of minimal at best. With these films' base appeal being that we have a new killer hiding behind the mask, which will hopefully be a surprise to the audience once they're revealed. It's very Scooby-Doo in formula. The whole thing was initiated by an experience writer Kevin Williamson had by getting spooked while house-sitting for a friend because he found a window open in the home and became convinced that there must be someone in there with him who had snuck in. Over the next three days, he quickly produced the first draft of the screenplay based on his love of slasher horror films that had become, both to him as well as to mass audiences, old hat and formulaic by this point. Writing the film's characters as people from our own world who would have seen these movies and known the typical rules and structures by which they operated. It brings to mind a similar instance of Paul Schrader quickly writing Taxi Driver in just a couple of days in a manic depressive state with a gun sitting beside his typewriter. The quick energy that process produced for both of these films is tangible in their final products. And this relationship to both older and modern horror, specifically slasher films, both textually as well as historically, is for better or worse a key aspect of the franchise that would remain to present day. Something that starts off very fresh and unique, but over time would decay into empty echoes of repetition in theme, that spends a lot of time talking but never actually saying anything meaningful. But at least for this first entry, it served both as a commentary on horror and also changed what horror would be. They never stopped making them, but since 1984, the slasher film had become less and less of a financially viable subgenre for a multitude of reasons. Public backlash from key prominent figures in film criticism like Roger Ebert led to cascading national protests from parent groups and other similar parties. The resulted in slashers going from traditional killers to supernatural entities to give them a less grounded fantasy feel to hopefully avoid such criticism. And they also began to pivot their business model to being primarily made for a limited theatrical release where they would recoup their money on the home video market. All of these things resulted in horror having a VHS boom in the late 80s and 90s that, while fun, was far from critically and culturally respected. And this is the contextual sandbox that Scream operates and plays in. At the time of writing this script, Williamson had essentially no industry clout whatsoever. He had sold one unmade screenplay and that was about it. And to his surprise, not only did his script find an eager buyer, but he found himself in the midst of a studio bidding war on who got the rights to make this film. Oliver Stone at one point was very interested in pursuing the project, which would have been a very different outcome with all of this, I imagine. The screenplay was written and shopped around under the working title of Scary Movie, which obviously would then be taken and repurposed by its parody just a few years later. Something which I've always wondered Williamson's opinions on, but never have actually found a statement from him addressing it. Eventually, Bob and Harvey Weinstein at Miramax won and purchased the rights to Williamson's script. And like they did with all of their horror films that they produced, they stepped in and forced some creative changes to the story. Most of which though honestly were not all that bad of changes and mostly made sense. They first changed the title to Scream because they were worried that scary movie sounded too much like a comedy. They also added the scene where Ghostface kills the principal because they were concerned that there was too long of a stretch from the beginning to the end without any violent and exciting scenes. The original script interestingly took place in my home state of North Carolina, where Williamson is also from, but was changed by the Weinsteins for the final film to be set in California, which was probably done for budgetary reasons. Which honestly, the fact that they both demanded so few changes and the ones that they did demand worked in favor of the film was pretty lucky both for us as audience members 
and for the people who worked on the film. As often it is the case within these franchise videos, that the Weinsteins enter the picture and kind of ruin a good thing. But Williamson was overall positive on the process here, as he would say, the story stayed pretty much intact, but we added some scares and shortened it. Wes reworked some of the action sequences, and we would argue and go back and forth, but there's a point where I had to realize that Wes is more experienced than I am. The Weinsteins offered Danny Boyle, Sam Raimi, Robert Rodriguez, George Romero, and Quentin Tarantino the role of director, all of which turned down the project. This is turned into a meta joke later in the series, where it is revealed in Scream 4 that the film within a film titled Stab was directed by this universe's version of Robert Rodriguez. Reportedly though, none of them really fully got or at least appreciated what the tone was supposed to be with this script, which is fair. Something like this with its particular style of humor is common now, but hadn't really fully existed in this way at this point in time outside of a few films. With one of the only ones to really reach mainstream status was the meta logic of Wes Craven's New Nightmare two years previously. It is funny to think about this in hindsight, but the studio didn't really want Craven to direct this, and he himself didn't want to make it either. Outside of New Nightmare, his last few films, while I think are excellent, had not been all that well received, and also, more importantly, did not make tremendous amounts of money like his earlier films had done. It would largely be fair to say that he was viewed in this time to be in a bit of a career slump, but they'd been looking for the right director for two months and hadn't come up with any reasonable fit, and Craven was looking for work, so it was a marriage of convenience more than anything else, really, because at that point, the film just had to get made. They worked out a deal and told him that if he made Scream for them, that he could make anything that he wanted after that within reason, which resulted in his only non-horror work, the musical Meryl Streep film, Music of the Heart, which was reviewed poorly and has been, since then, essentially forgotten. Which is honestly kind of a bummer, because he never wanted to be stuck being a horror guy within film despite his talents for it. And I kind of hate for him that he never got to have a second late-in-life art film career that he clearly wanted. You know, there's just those moments in time where two collaborators come together at just the right stages in their career to lift each other up in a way that the resulting art feels impossibly good to exist. Comparing other slashers to the first Scream would be almost unfair in how perfect of a combination that Craven and Williamson had, at least in their first outing. Craven essentially had a massive place within three decades of horror filmmaking, from The Hills Have Eyes in the 70s, Nightmare on Elm Street in the 80s, and Scream in the 90s. He obviously continued to work on up through the 2000s and early 2010s, but never really had another culturally quintessential film in that time. But right here in this moment was at a peak of his abilities within the medium. What they did here is the definition of iconic. Scream is such a currently beloved franchise within internet culture that has a certain bubble of modern popularity surrounding it that I'm even a little worried about throwing my hat into that ring. Amongst the legacy franchises, it certainly has the largest modern online fandom surrounding it, and that at least at the moment gives it a bit of a unique feel to it. You don't see nearly as much merchandise for other franchises around in public, like you see Ghostface on things. And it wasn't just Williamson and Craven on this project that were at their best. The whole production was operating like a well-oiled machine. From the sets, to the costumes, the music, the lighting, everything here works so well and just came together near perfectly. So much so that it's a little staggering to witness it. The ghost face design took a great deal of stages and refinement to get to the final look featured in the film. The production was in an interesting spot, in being too creatively open in what the design could be. Because in the script, Williamson had only specified that the killer was wearing a mask, but never describes the mask or costume in any detail at all, except for one moment where it is described as being ghostly. This led to the team to focus on that single word, and try to create a killer based around this ghost motif. In that mindset, the robe that the killer originally was going to be wearing was going to be sparkling white instead of sparkling black, to make him look like a cartoon ghost, almost to be reminiscent of a sheet ghost like in the original Halloween. But when they did initial screen tests, it looked like he was a slasher clansman, and they decided that changes had to be made. They eventually landed on the same design except now in black to give it a Father Death Grim Reaper kind of vibe. As a side note, I've seen people argue online that they should bring back the white costume to be used for just one Scream movie that is set in a snowy location, which I think could be a great shakeup for the series and would actually work. 
There should be more snow horror movies in general. I know they're very hard to make and also expensive, but they also are always fun and the setting adds a great deal to the isolation of the horror. The knife that Ghostface uses in every single film is a Buck 120 hunting knife that is very recognizable with its black handle and eye-catching divot on the other end of the blade. I doubt this is the reason they picked this, but I do think it is very funny that it is the exact same model knife that has been driven through Jason's eye in the poster for Friday the 13th, the final chapter. The mask itself was another huge legal issues on multiple fronts because it already existed and was not created for this movie, similar to the Michael Myers William Shatner mask from Halloween. In 1990, makeup artist Lauren Gittins designed this concept art for an elevated visual design of a sheet ghost that could be used in a possible future film for Altarian Studios, who did the makeup work on films like Hocus Pocus, Army of Darkness, and the Child's Play films. During a time of low business offers for the studio, they started a new division of making Halloween costumes, including a line of six ghost designs, one of which was the first stage of what we would later know as Ghostface. Then came a company called Fun World in the early 90s, who were notorious for stealing designs for other companies and slightly modifying them for their own cheaper Halloween masks, which they famously did with the Ghostface design. During pre-production, producer Marianne Maddalena brought the Fun World version of the mask in as a possible inspiration for where the team could go with the design. And Craven loved it so much that he became fixated on it and wouldn't budge saying that that was the exact mask that they had to use in the film and not a stylized variation take on it. That specific mask was the one for the movie. But a deal with Fun World could not be negotiated in time, who did not want their mask associated with the film. Greg Nicotero of Walking Dead fame was hired to create a knockoff mask that was different enough to where they wouldn't get sued for using it. But this ended up not being needed because a deal was finally reached between the studio and Fun World that allowed the production to use their version of the mask. Although this deal came after production had already begun, and so the original weird looking mask can still be found in a couple quick shots in two scenes in the first movie, the opening sequence and the scene with the principal. Still to this day, if you buy any official Scream merchandise, it will have the Fun World logo on its packaging. Lauren Gittins, the original artist, has never seen a dime from his design being used as the backbone for the Scream franchise. The thing I kind of love about these movies is that they very much lean into the Scooby-Doo nature of this idea of the mask killer. It is almost a supernatural thing that exists within the universe and filmic logic of this franchise that nobody really minds or ever even really talks about because it's a non-issue. It doesn't matter how tall, short, young, or old the killer is. Until their identity is revealed, Ghostface is always a tall, fit, young man who always has the same proportions until the mask reveal at the end of the film. In fact, Ghostface was played by the same stuntman in the first four films, before being replaced by a different stuntman for the most recent two films. It's just a fun thing about this to me. And lastly, as far as the character is concerned, arguably the most memorable part of the whole thing that sells this presence is that voice. Roger L. Jackson is the unsung hero propping up the Scream franchise. I would argue that a less impactful voice would have made Scream less popular today than it currently is. That voice is just one of the coolest sounds and instantly changes the vibe of this character. I love the almost supernatural element to this series also, that everyone essentially has these magical voice changers that all makes them sound the same when they have the mask on. It's something that could easily annoy me if done with a slightly different tone, but it just really works. In my book, his performance is an all-timer for voice acting in major films. He's the only reason that the first scene with Casey works the way that it does, and his voice impacts your impression of the character for minutes before you ever actually see him. For the longest time in that scene, that character is that voice. The killer is just this menacing sound coming through the telephone. And outside of Courtney Cox, he's the only person to appear in every entry of the franchise and is actually the only one to appear in every entry if you count the MTV show that she was not in. Also known as Powerpuff Girls' Mojo Jojo, Jackson made this part his own, and the inflection that he puts on certain words makes it so memorable. And through that, he has become one of the most recognizable pieces of iconography associated with the series, and most people don't even know what he looks like. The cast have also largely been what this movie's remembered for, and they all do an excellent job in this across the board. 
Scream is a unique franchise in horror and that it is very character focused. When you think of Friday the 13th, you think of Jason. When you think of Nightmare on Elm Street, you think of Freddy. But when you think of Scream, you also think of Gail, Sidney, and Dewey. And while the iconography of Ghostface is a driving force in the marketing of this franchise, this is a weird one in that its cultural love comes from people loving its recurring protagonists. You know, most of these horror franchises exist on having a recurring villain that attacks a new group of unsuspecting people each time. From a writing perspective, this is a lot easier to handle. Because how do you possibly write entire movies if we start in the first scene with the characters not only knowing what the threat is, but also knowing exactly how to stop it? There's no sense of discovery there, and in that, very little room to grow and build a compelling narrative. Most of these movies are very formulaic in nature. We're introduced to a young cast of people who symbolically release unrelenting evil into the world. They are hunted down for this, and some of them die. And in the third act, they discover the weakness of the monster, and in a final climactic battle, turn the tides against him, and through that, overcome their own personal vices or issues. This is how almost all of these films work. And in franchises where you do have recurring characters, you sometimes get really weird solutions to that problem that never really work. Such as the recent Insidious, The Red Door, that gives the whole cast amnesia to where they don't remember the events of the earlier films, to circumvent those issues, which was kind of laughable. Very few are like Phantasm, that has an actual ongoing continuing story that takes place over decades, with mostly the same cast members returning each time. And that's cool to see, and is something that makes Scream special. And the base mystery aspect with a different killer in the same mask time and time again is the secret ingredient to this continued longevity. Each film is familiar but is able to be different enough to not know what to expect going into it, which is kind of genius. As far as the cast are concerned, there are also a lot of people who almost made it in here that ultimately did not, any of which would have made the film a very different kind of project. Vanessa Shaw, Reese Witherspoon, Molly Ringwald, and Brittany Murphy were all in the running for Sydney. Seth Green, Jason Lee, Brecklin Meyer, Brooke Shields, Thora Birch, and Natasha Lyonne also almost were cast as well. Lyonne only missed out on the project because she was under 18, and her parents would not sign off on her being in the production. Matthew Lillard, who probably gives the performance of his career in this, ended up being in the movie entirely on accident, as he just by happenstance bumped into the casting director who liked his look and asked him if he was an actor, to which he said yes. And she then told him to audition for the film because she would cast him. Just so much of this worked by pure coincidence and timing, which is kind of amazing, but also just how life works sometimes. Even if the rest of the movie was bad, which it isn't, the first scene alone would have cemented it in the history of horror cinema forever. I know you don't need to be told this, but Drew Barrymore being the face on the poster and her name getting top billing was a purposeful ruse to trick audiences into believing the film would have been one thing before her being killed not even 10 minutes into it, sending it into an entirely different unexpected direction. An intention that clearly worked, one that has been attempted to be done with each subsequent film to varying degrees of success. Although while she has today very much embraced the film, there is believed to have been possibly some more nuance to how this scene came together than what it one time was believed. It is well documented that Craven and the Weinsteins originally offered Barrymore the lead role of Sydney, but that she turned it down, and that it was even reportedly her idea to play Casey at the beginning, to add a shock to the start of the film. But it has been insinuated from some involved with the production that at the time, she didn't even want to do that, but did that one scene in the movie to avoid political retaliation from the Weinsteins that would have resulted from her turning them down. Everything about this opening is pinpoint perfection on a pure filmmaking level, to a degree that may have never been topped before or since its filming within horror movies. It is a parody of a traditional horror opening, yes, but in that, it so successfully articulates what makes a slasher opening work that it distills it to its finest essence. Riffing on tropes that were popularized with movies such as Halloween, Psycho, and Texas Chainsaw, that date back even to earlier films, even incorporating small parts of the extremely memorable Halloween score into its own score when they're talking about that film on the phone. The blocking alone of the sequence could be studied as a masterclass up there along the likes of virtuosos of the medium like Spielberg. Just how every single shot flows into the next with purposeful thought and intention. 
how you can see the silhouette of Casey's boyfriend tied up outside on the patio before you or her even know that he's out there. This is a trap laid just for her. She is dead before the scene even begins, and the filmmaking is designed to subtly indicate that, even if we do not consciously recognize it. The hyper wide angle lenses that even distort the rooms of the house some, both add a disorienting effect to the frame of the image, but also allow us to see as much of Casey's surroundings as possible. It makes her feel more alone, more vulnerable in the open space, prey in a barren field waiting to be slaughtered by an unseen predator that we know is watching and playing a game for his own amusement. Having Casey casually walk through the house on the phone, playfully talking with her killer before she realizes the severity of the situation, adds both a feeling of building impending dread, but also gives us time to understand the physicality and layout of this space. Without that, we don't know where people could be hiding, and thus would not feel the tension that we later do in the chase. The gliding camera cycling through the same rooms adds a certain rhythm to the scene as well. And on top of that, this scene not only sets up the film, but directly sets up or gives away its ending depending on how you look at it. The last trivia question of the game that Ghostface plays with her on the phone is, which door am I standing at? He tells her that if she picks correctly, she will be allowed to escape with her life. But she seemingly makes the wrong decision and is killed. There are only two doors in the house that we are shown that lead outside. However, we later learn that there are in fact two killers working together. Their game with her has been rigged. We can just assume that as the viewer. She would never be allowed to leave this situation. And thus through that, we can presume the question leads to evidence of where the ending will go if we examine that before it is ever revealed. It's small, but those kinds of details are crucial parts of good mysteries that are often overlooked in the writing process. Mystery films are often frustrating experiences to me because the filmmakers don't want you to figure it out before they give you the final answer. But to do that, they withhold crucial information and clues to keep you in the dark and make it impossible for you to really deduce what is happening here, which many of the later Scream films are very guilty of. This first one is one of the only ones that actually functions as a proper mystery story that you could plausibly figure out before the final revelation, and I think is one of the things that has resulted in its longevity in pop culture. It's actually kind of amazing to watch how much Craven grows as an artist throughout his career. The Hills Have Eyes Part 2 was only a decade before this, and it is just an all-around awful film that is just about as clunky as something can be. But here he has leveled up and excelled to a new place within genre storytelling. And in that mindset, this technical mastery of horror continues to be the ethos and design of the rest of the film. Something that is not often given as much credit as it deserves in my opinion is just how much of the early franchise under Craven's direction took place in the daytime. All too often, horror cinema relies on it being dark to artificially add spooky to a scene to make up for a lack of craft. It takes genuine skill, intention, and practice to create something this tense in a well-lit environment. All you have to do is compare the Cenobite scenes in the original Hellraiser to their new entirely shrouded in blackness outing last year to see how much things have changed and how people are afraid of turning on the lights. You can't see a damn thing that is happening in that film most of the time, which frustrated me and made me not really enjoy it very much. A similar complaint has been very recently lodged against the new Pet Cemetery film. And I think that Scream went out of its way to always have a bright color palette, which is something that should be commended. Even the few nighttime based scenes are luminous. There is never ambiguity as to what is happening in the shot, which is important as this franchise clearly prides itself on its impeccable visual presentation. Scream of course is also, as we said, known for the meta elements that Williamson incorporated into the script. He said on the process of writing that original draft that, I thought if you could expose the rules and play with them, then the audience doesn't know what they're going to get. Suddenly they're on edge. I started playing with the tropes and the rules were part of that. And this whole thing goes beyond the dialogue about scary movies. That is a given, as the killer Billy's obsession with horror movies permeates every aspect of this and dictates the tone of the film. Even his last name of Loomis being an extension of that and is one of the only times I've not hated a referential name in a movie but the filmmaking itself on Craven's part embraces those elements that Williamson started in his script. There's so many small jokes at play here, even down to little things like cutting from the principal being killed to a bunch of kids listening to Alice Cooper's School's Out for Summer, blaring from the radio. 
Jamie Kennedy playing Randy yelling turn around Jamie at Jamie Lee Curtis on the TV just as he's about to get attacked from behind. Sydney saying that she doesn't like horror movies because the female victims are dumb and always run upstairs when they're trying to get out of the house. Only two moments later run in blind fear upstairs instead of going outside. A lot of little narrative things like that. But this is all largely written and done in relation to Halloween specifically. When Williamson was writing the script in those three days, he claims to have been frequently playing the score to Halloween in the background to put him in the right mental headspace. Within the film itself, the way that the camera glides through scenes is very much purposefully referencing how Carpenter did similar work in his movie. The wide angle lenses and frames may have even been a purposeful style decision to reference those movies because that wasn't something that Craven had engaged in much previously in his career up until this point, but is a mainstay hallmark of Carpenter's style. This movie obviously is intended to be, in particular, a spiritual successor to Halloween, which is a ballsy move. Usually if someone tells you that they're trying to recreate the success and style of a culturally iconic film, you would give them a fairly good heaping of side eye in response to the delusion of it all, something that we all just witnessed happen with Exorcist Believer. But at least in this instance, they pulled it off and did exactly what they set out to do. The small town having a curfew feels like the exact same setting as Haddonfield. The car from Halloween that Michael steals is even in the background of one shot. Casey's neighbors are named the McKenzies, just like in that movie. Let alone the entire final sequence, essentially being a massive parody of the final act of Halloween. From Sydney in the car with Ghostface mirroring Annie and Michael Myers, to Dewey's Kinergy, clearly being an exaggeration of how inept Sam Loomis was in trying to stop his patient's path of unhinged violence. Which would make 2000's Scary Movie a parody of a parody which I actually kind of love as a distillation of trope and genre. That final scene of the party lasts a shocking 42 minutes and took 21 consecutive nights of filming to complete, and for my money, is one of the most standout set pieces in horror history, and is probably about the longest climax in any horror film. You don't need me to tell you this is great. You already know that. It hasn't been topped since it was created, even by the more expensive Scream sequels. The meta aspect at play in Scream builds within this to the line in the final act, which serves as, I believe, the thesis statement of the piece when Billy says, Movies don't create psychos, movies make psychos more creative. Which is actually something that I personally don't like within this work, or the franchise as a whole. I love Scream. It is far and away THE horror film of the 90s. But this is a topic that I personally don't like horror or media in general to even try to actively engage with. It is a naturally conservative and reactionary viewpoint to ask if violent media causes or inspires real-world violence. After every tragedy, conservative politicians and media personalities immediately start for attention and diversion purposes, talking about what this person was reading or watching or playing or associating with, which may have caused them to kill other people, which of course is illogical, and diverting from the actual issues of guns. Guns are the issue, not movies and they never have been. There have even been some awful and tonally bizarre films like Random Acts of Violence that even accept and reinforce this notion, ultimately saying that horror is bad and shouldn't be made within a horror film. And to try and engage with this purposefully false and distracting rhetoric is to be automatically taking an unneeded defensive platform, one that isn't necessary to be taken in fiction at all, but is too often in my taste done by horror media fans. I often feel like horror personalities have almost a chip on their shoulders for horror not being considered a part of award season, or horror being so-called attacked in the media for being harmful, or not included in the larger conversation about film. Which to me is quite silly. It's getting worked up over nothing. A non-issue. We shouldn't care. We shouldn't even acknowledge it, because nobody actually does this anymore. This isn't the early 1980s. We should only be reactive to actual credible threats to the status of the genre, such as the Congress legislation against comics in the 50s, which these types of threats haven't really actually existed for decades now in any credible way. Horror is fine. It doesn't need defending currently. It will still exist and doesn't need tweets that don't actually do anything except create a false sense of morality battle that doesn't actually exist and whose outcome doesn't matter. In reality, Conservative grifters under no circumstances should ever be argued with because they know more than anyone how fake and ludicrous their positions are. They don't believe in anything that they actually say. They never do. 
It is all said to deflect from their actual positions, which are much more evil and clandestine. That is part of the thing that makes them fascists. And to argue with them on their fake beliefs is to legitimize them, both as people and as a political ideology. And so for me personally, Scream falls apart in its final messaging at its end, because it is fighting a battle that is both fake and not needed to fight. A self-imposed one over art and morality that hits my ears as someone shifting up their glasses and going, well, actually. It feels unnecessary to have this grand statement on culture, the state of horror at the end of all of this. And to a degree, stands in the way of the excellent set piece and story that they have been carefully building this whole time. But overall, it doesn't affect the film all that much. And the argument could be made that this line and plot direction works as it is being spoken by a dumb teenager who thinks he's more deep than he actually is after all. But still, I found myself thinking about the intended purpose of this inclusion in Scream more than I have with just about anything else in it, which is not an amazing lasting memory for a film to leave its audience with. And for me, this uncomfortably seems to be a reoccurring theme that the series would like to explore time and time again, but never really has the ability to grapple with it in any meaningful way that is fully worth our time and should have been abandoned after the first entry. And honestly, just shouldn't have been in that one either. This relationship between fictional violence and real violence. In the sequel the following year, it is essentially the main thematic throughline. There's the whole aspect of Sydney receiving prank calls from people pretending to be Ghostface, because they're inspired to torment her from watching the film adaptation of her life called Stab. We Watch as a Film Class debates the merits of Stab as a work of art, and on if horror fiction has real-world impacts beyond basic commerce. And it all comes across as Freshman Philosophy 101. I mean, that whole film is essentially about someone wanting to recreate the events of the movie in real life. One of the most overt points in this comes in the opening scene, when Jada Pinkett Smith is being actually killed in the theater that is screening Stab. And we are intercut with images of crazed horror fanatic audience members, celebrating and imitating the killing of Heather Graham that they're watching on their screen. It's a great scene, one of the best in the series, but what is it trying to say? Does this actually want to communicate anything to us, the real audience in the real world? To realistically say that this is your position and that you think that horror cinema is an overly harmful thing to the people who view it would be to say that you too have blood on your hands from producing horror. It's a half-baked message. It's a question that they don't actually want to answer, want the answer to, or really even be bothered with the ramifications of that is repeated too often throughout the series, and in horror itself, for no overt purpose except for thematically attempting to connect with the ideas of the first film. And slightly taints my enjoyment of the overall series because I just don't believe them. It feels hollow and not actually true to the person who is saying it. The whole franchise below the surface to me reads as being completely ideologically incoherent. The least interesting thing that a work of horror can ask is if its own existence is harmful and we should just move beyond this as a genre. We don't need it anymore. Now in that particular instance with two, it does have a slight aspect of nuance in dealing with the morality of true crime as well, which I think we can all agree should be treated really as its own separate thing, but still, you know what I mean. Now, before we move on to discussing the sequels, I would like to take a moment to ask you that if you are enjoying this or any of my previous work, that you might consider supporting me on Patreon. This channel is entirely supported and made possible by viewers like you. And for only $1 a month, you can help to ensure that I'm able to produce these long-form retrospectives on classic works of horror more often. Your support means a tremendous amount to me, and genuinely, none of this would be possible without you. These videos would simply no longer exist. So thank you so much. You can find that at patreon.com forward slash praise of shadows. Obviously, Scream was a massive hit, both critically and commercially. At the time, it was one of the most financially successful horror films ever made, and the single most successful slasher film, with a box office return of $173 million, which for a horror movie was essentially unheard of. It was the fourth highest grossing movie of 1996, behind Mission Impossible, Twister, and Independence Day. Its impact was hard and immediate, and is the single film that fully signaled the transition from what the dying 80s horror trends had been to what the 90s and early 2000s would be until the release of Saw in 2004. There's a definitive line in film history before and after Scream, and for better or worse, 
A sequel was rushed into production and landed in theaters just under a year after the first film's release. Multiple different titles were considered on what this project should be called, ranging from Scream, the sequel, Scream Again, and Scream Louder, before simply being titled Scream 2. As part of the deal with the first script, Williamson also delivered at the time two different five-page outlines on where potential Scream sequels could go, one of which was the basis of this script which Williamson was hired to quickly write. But this process was longer than they had hoped for, and unfortunately the Weinsteins made the decision to go ahead and begin filming before this draft had even been completed. Based on the success and overwhelming popularity of the first film, the studio actually was worried about leaks online and made Williamson write three different final acts of the movie, two fake ones, and one real one that would only be given to the smallest circle of the most trusted, need-to-know people. And their fears ended up being justified, as one of the fake endings, as well as the first full two acts, did wind up on the internet before the film's release in December of 1997. Some speculate that the ending that leaked online was actually intended to be the real ending, but who is to say? All that is really known is the result of this, which was that Williamson seemingly, in very little time, had to draft a completely new script with a fourth ending that became the real one that was used in the movie, that had already filmed some sequences, and was actively filming additional sequences unscripted. As you can imagine, this created an extremely chaotic tone to the shoot that fueled resentment and distrust among the cast and crew. Scream 2 because of this is considered to be the first film to actually have real-world effects on its production because of the existence of the internet. Craven, who was also brought back to direct the sequel, was reportedly quite frustrated by all of this, justifiably. The film from beginning to end had essentially a six-month turnaround, and as a result, all aspects of production were happening simultaneously in a way that no one would ever actually want to do. They didn't start shooting until June of 97, and by that point, there were only 42 pages of the new script actually completed. And within weeks, they had reached a situation where they sometimes were receiving new pages in the morning that they were going to be shooting only hours later that same day. Reportedly, one scene that they were supposed to shoot came in unfinished, and at the bottom of the page, Williamson had written, Wes Craven will make it scary. By all accounts, it was a generally unpleasant production to be on compared to the first one, but miraculously, the movie's still pretty good. It is generally considered to be one of the better films in the franchise, and while I wouldn't quite say that, I would agree that it is a lot of fun and could have ended up being a lot worse than it is. There are not any outright bad Scream movies, and we're lucky that these films exist at the level of quality that they exude. There's a certain expectation to the Scream name, and people working on these knew that even if the production was a train wreck, they still had to deliver as high quality of a product as possible. You can't phone in this franchise like you can on some others. It has probably the most bottle opening out of the entire series, and also the second most memorable behind the original. We find a couple, Maureen and Phil, who have gone out to the movies to watch Stab, the film within this universe based on the events of the first movie. This film within a film sequence parodying the original was actually directed by a young Robert Rodriguez, who had rapport with the Weinsteins through his connection to Quentin Tarantino as well as for making From Dust Till Dawn for them the previous year. He would then in 1998 go on to direct another Kevin Williamson project for the company as well, The Faculty, which can almost be looked at as a Scream-adjacent project along with I Know What You Did Last Summer. This sequence is great. It isn't realistic at all. It is stylized even more than the Scream movies tend to be. But this works in its favor as a really iconic moment within the franchise that stands out as a result. Jada Pinkett Smith, up on the stage looking out over the cheering crowd, is the tone setter for the film that both mirrors what the ending will be and gets us back into that very specific scream mood. In horror franchise filmmaking, the first film starts the franchise, but the sequels in turn mythologize it. The importance of these franchises is almost self-imposed worship of the first film in their series, building this up over time as an act of self-mythologizing. You don't ever have people making direct sequels to the second, third, or fourth movies in a series, as much as I'd love to see that. A modern, outright sequel to Texas Chainsaw 2 with Old Man Chop Top would be a film made just for me. But within these franchises, time and time again, they always are riffing on the first one, and to a degree, that is the space that Scream 2 is playing in, as well as all of the following Scream follow-ups. 
sequels talking about and actively engaging in the creation of legacy through the act of producing sequels and films in general. The creation of Stab builds this legacy of the Woodsboro murders that hangs over those who experience this. They are not allowed to move on because the story must continue and be worshipped in these churches of sorts that have their own rituals and customs. This is present in the film within the film, but also through the killer's seeming obsession with those events. This movie finds Sydney in college, but even in a new town far away, she can't seem to escape what happened to her back in Woodsboro. It has literally and metaphorically followed her here and not allowed the fresh start that she desired. As much as these films differ from each other, they also are kind of the same movie each time. A new killer arises and the gang gets back together to stop him. That's no complaint. They just have a very set formula that only has changes dictated by the new setting, situation, and killer. This one being centered around Sydney's new life at college as Dewey, Randy, and Gail get dragged back from their normal lives into the action that is based around her school. Ultimately, the killer is going to be revealed as Mickey, who is being helped by a second killer, Billy's mother from the first movie, Nancy, who's out for revenge over the death of her son. Now, Nancy's motivation I understand completely, but still to this day, I don't fully understand why Mickey is doing these things except for just also being motivated by the movies, like the first time. It is probably my least favorite ghost face reveal in the series because it just falls flat for me. It, even more than the first one, feels like the movie is trying to form an essay based around an argument on film violence, rather than just telling a story that makes logical sense. But the ensuing fight that takes place on the stage is great, so it's mostly fine. It's serviceable. The film also gets away with a lot because there's a running commentary theme on sequels, being blatant rehashes of their first films, only slightly less good this time around. So with jokes like this, these issues are things that are easy to forgive because some of them can be written off as being intentional. One thing that you've really got to commend both this film and the first film is that they depict very common settings within horror and fiction at large without falling into the generic traps associated with those settings. Scream 1 is a high school movie. Scream 2 is a college movie. But despite having scenes of characters obsessed over how tropes in movies are played out, they very much play by their own rules. Outside of one frat scene, everything in this feels fairly original to Scream 2. We aren't leaning or borrowing visuals too heavily from other films, which would have been the easy and lazy way to do this. Going back to the example of Insidious the Red Door, this is the exact opposite of how this is handled, and that was one of the most baffling new horror films that I'd seen in a very long time. Looking at how the college stuff was presented in that versus how it is depicted in this gives you a good idea on how deceptively smart Scream 2 is in its use of its setting. And while I had talked about ultimately disliking the core theme of the movie, of questioning if horror is good or bad, there's a lot in this movie about profiteering on true crime that I really jive with. Gail being the villain that she is at this point in the series, gets furious that there's talks of pulling Stab from theaters, which is based on her true crime book, due to the film seemingly inspiring a new killer. Her argument being that the copycat killer would give them the best advertising that they could ever hope for and that the box office numbers are going to soar as a result. There's a clear commentary that human lives and the safety of others are secondary to the profits that this could make. Cotton Weary, the man who had unjustly gone to prison for being accused of murdering Sidney's mother in the first movie, has in my opinion one of the strongest arcs of the series. You go from believing that he's a convicted murderer in part one, to him being released and having to live with this shame and suspected remnants of guilt that have been unfairly thrust on him for something that he did not do. And then in the third film, we see a time jump where he's hosting his own maori like trashy daytime TV show centered around solving true crime stories before finally being killed by a new copycat ghost face. It is a full bizarre circle that ties into one of the biggest themes of Scream as a franchise, which is the corruption of power and money and how it relates to popular media, which is what the third film is entirely about. But before we get to that, a fun fact is that, to my knowledge, this is the only film in the franchise that Roger L. Jackson was actually present for the shooting of, as Craven thought that it might add to their performances if they heard that voice on the other end of the phone in real time. And so all of the telephones were rigged to actual landlines, 
where Jackson was actually speaking to them in the ghost-faced voice while shooting these scenes, which apparently was an uncomfortable task for the actors to deal with, which may be why they didn't do it again for the further sequels, because it seems like they didn't enjoy it at all. This also was going to end with a third ghost face standing on the edge of the roof of the bell tower looking down at them, insinuating that the full mystery had not yet been resolved and that we would learn more in the next installment, which is a super fun idea. I'd love to see one of these films tie directly into the next one, which is something that we've never received from Scream. But at the same time, it is also a limiting idea on where a third film could go with its narrative. And so at the last minute, this was decided against and cut from the film, leaving the ending unambiguous. Scream 3 was a mistake, or that seems to be how it is often viewed, especially in the window of time soon after the film's release. The common consensus is that it should not have been made, or at least not under the conditions that the studio set for itself, and is kind of seen as the black sheep of the family, at least within the original trilogy a spot that would later be more filled with Scream 4. It has been argued that 3 inadvertently killed Scream for a time. You can argue that this was the planned ending of it being a trilogy all you want. The film even says that, but money talks. And if this had been better received or made significantly more money, then there almost certainly would have been a new Scream film sooner than we had gotten one. Coming in 2000, just two years after part two, they felt an almost self-imposed pressure on what kind of content they could or could not get away with in a post-Columbine world. At one point, they even internally debated making the film PG-13, abandoning the majority of the slasher basis of the series and having all of the violence happen off screen, leaning more into the murder mystery aspect of the series, something which Craven lobbied against and eventually won saying that if they were going to make a proposed Scream sequel, then they should make a real Scream sequel and be true to the brand. But the planned script that they had intended to go with was scrapped and entirely reworked into something less intense, even changing the identity of the final killer, as it was originally intended for Matthew Lillard to come back to enact his revenge, revealing that he had survived his incident with the TV set, which would have been a nice way to round out the trilogy something that would have been much better than what we got and is still teased within the franchise today. The most recent Scream 6 had a joke related to this and even a final payoff with one of the ghost face killers of the movie getting finished off by having the same television dropped on their head. Lillard's return would have been welcome to see, but you can imagine why they must have felt like this had to be done to distance themselves from Columbine because admittedly Stu Mocker and Billy Loomis do share some similarities with Eric Harris and Dylan Clebett, despite the film coming out three years before that incident. The other thing against this film going into it is that Williamson had become quite popular as a screenwriter within Hollywood by this point in time, based on the popularity of Scream and his other similar projects. And he actually backed out of the sequel to focus on other works, leaving them 20 pages of notes of where the series could go in the future. Funny enough, the new writer that they brought in to replace him was named Ethren Kruger, which, you know, is very funny considering the Craven connection. I don't particularly like Kruger's writing style. I've really only enjoyed two films that he's worked on as a writer, which were The Ring and Top Gun Maverick. I don't mean to trash anyone's work, but he does have a run of uniquely rough films under his belt through the section of his career from 2005's The Skeleton Key to The Brothers Grimm, Blood and Chocolate, Transformers 2, 3, and 4, Ghost in the Shell, and then Dumbo. Like, I'm really not trying to be mean, but he's just not the kind of guy that you want in charge of something as innovative as Scream. This franchise more or less requires bold choices to function, and they certainly go there with the setting this time around. But in action and practice, I don't think a lot of this is in line with the ethos of the series. Kruger kind of seemed bummed out, about how all of this went down too, which does make me sad to see. He said that he took the job only because he wanted to get the chance to have Craven direct his work, but that before accepting it, he wasn't even really all that familiar with Scream, had not seen either of the films, and did not seem to fully understand the extent of the impact that the series had already had by this point. He said that he felt since he had spent no time with the cast during the production of the first two films, that he was at a bit of a disadvantage in knowing their cadence of dialogue. And because of this, Craven reportedly had to personally rewrite entire sections of the script himself. 
because in his eyes, Kruger's dialogue and character decisions were so off base of where they should be, particularly in relation to Sydney who despite being the main character of the series, gets very little to do in this film. As the focus is largely on the relationship between Dewey and Gale this time around, Craven was so involved in fixing up Kruger's script that Kruger argued on the behalf of Craven, saying that he should be given a co-writing credit, which Craven did not accept. There are whole sections in this movie that aren't even in the script that they shot with. It seems that Craven realized what was going on in the situation very early, and sort of just took over to steer the ship back in the right direction, without any blueprints to guide him, and mostly did an excellent job with that. The whole part where Sydney goes back to her childhood home, but it's actually just a recreated set for a future stab movie, where she then gets attacked by Ghostface, wasn't written in Kruger's script at all, which is one of the standout moments of the film. But while I know that Kruger was going off of the notes left behind by Williamson, plus had the editorial oversight by Craven, and shouldn't get all the credit, I actually do think that this movie is pretty clever at times in what it's doing on a narrative level. It is about the Hollywood production of Stab 3, and a new ghost face who has stolen a copy of the script, and is going around the set killing the actors in the order that they are intended to die within the film. The only thing is that the film has already had a troubled production, and to prevent leaks from the cast, they have all been given multiple versions of the script that has different people being killed with multiple different endings, and they don't know which copy of the script that Ghostface has. Meaning that, at any given time, anyone could theoretically be in danger, mirroring in a really unique and funny way the chaotic experience that they had all just shared making Scream 2. In fact, there's quite a lot of Scream 2 jokes in this film, with the characters being frustrated that they're showing up to work for the day, not even knowing what scenes they're going to be shooting, because they haven't received their finished pages yet. The unfortunate thing about this, though, is that by the end of production, similar issues hit the Scream 3 team that happened on Scream 2, with rewrites being demanded on the spot from the studio, resulting in scenes being drafted the same day that they were to be shot. This led to another extremely frustrating production for all of those involved, as you can imagine. By the end of it, they were shooting at least three to five different variations of every single scene because the script was just changing so much, and they wanted to have enough footage to try and save the film into something that was at least watchable in the edit. They just opted to film so much coverage so that they could edit the story into practically anything that they wanted to, and this saved them in the end and is probably one of the only reasons that Scream 3 isn't an absolute train wreck and is at the very least a watchable good time and has also led to a legendary lost alternative cut of Scream 3 that is supposedly just a practically different film. All of this comes together in one of the weaker mask reveals in the series, as Roman removes his hood and reveals to Sydney that he is her long-lost brother that her mother abandoned when she was very young after her acting career had fallen apart. He has returned after all of these years to seek revenge on the film studio and the producer who ruined her mental health which led her to making that decision, and on Sydney for taking his place in her mother's life. This is all okay, I don't hate it by any means, but none of it was telegraphed at all. It kind of comes out of left field and leaves you with a general feeling of, well, all right. That's not how mysteries function at all. You could never in a million years guess where we're going with this. And to a minor extent, it is a betrayal both to the audience and the foundation of what these movies should be like. One of the original proposed twists for this movie I think would have been better than what we got here. In Williamson's notes that he left behind, he suggested the idea that the ghost face in this movie and the victims would all be in some secret part of a stab live action role playing fan club and are all in on one big joke reenactment of the stab movies and the original Woodsboro killings and that essentially it would be a LARPing session that had just gotten out of hand, and that nobody was actually dead or even ever actually in real danger. It's just that we would be seeing these things from Sydney's perspective, who would assume that there was an actual danger to the situation. The film would have ended with all of the victims coming back to life and laughing at a party about how fun the whole reenactment had been. It's a bit of an anti-ending, and I can understand why they didn't go that route in the finished film, because it honestly is surreal and bizarre. But if there was a franchise where you could get away with something like that, it certainly would be this one. It's an ending that people would still be talking about today, whereas no one is talking about the actual ending of Scream 3 anymore. 
This is the film where light supernatural elements are first added into the story, which is something that I really think should be avoided at all costs. Part of the appeal of Scream is that it isn't like other horror franchises, and falls much more in line with the early slashers, and that it is very grounded in a way that is very unique to its identity at that time. It is a franchise that is obsessed with the rules of horror, but it too has its very own, very clearly defined rules and logic that it sticks to, and elaborate dream sequences don't really add to the atmosphere as much as it takes away. We also have a universe-breaking appearance of Jay and Silent Bob here, who are taking a tour on the studio lot, which makes zero sense and is jarring to a degree that I just really hate its inclusion here. It isn't fully awful in this one, but things like this introduce a slippery slope, and by the time we get to 5 and 6, we have really bad scenes with Sam having full-on hallucination conversations, with the ghost of her dead father, Billy, from the first film. Everything like this should be avoided in this universe to me. There are so many horror films where you can easily play with those ideas if you want to, but from my perspective, Scream is fun in how it is limited to the bounds of our real, physical universe, where people are easily hurt and clumsy. I don't want people to think that I hate this one either though, far from it. Just because I have a lot of criticisms doesn't mean that it is a bad movie. As I said, there's never really been an actual bad Scream film, and by and large, it is essentially the most consistently well-produced, long-running horror film series. There really isn't anything quite like it, and I think that should be celebrated. And on the topic of its quality, it is a film that has, even in recent years, been on the receiving end of a bit of a cultural reassessment, as it has in modern times been read as a secret rebuke of Harvey Weinstein. Ghostface is killing this time because his mother was sexually abused by a predatory producer with a great deal of power. When cornered about his practices with younger women at the midpoint of the film, the producer says, It was in the 70s. Everything was different. I was well known for my parties. It was for girls like her to meet men, men who could get them parts if they made the right impression. Nothing happened to her that she didn't invite in one way or another, no matter what she said afterwards. You want to get ahead in Hollywood? You've got to play the game. Wes Craven essentially has Harvey Weinstein's throat slit open on screen in a movie that was produced by Harvey Weinstein, which, even if the rest of the film was awful, it'd be worth watching just for that sub-narrative. But also, this is only actually a very small part of the film. It amounts to maybe five minutes of the runtime, if that. And I think that if it had become more of the primary focus of the story rather than a background secret underlying motivation, it may have been more impactful. But realistically, there's only so far that they could have pushed that before it became an issue that Weinstein would have stopped. So I get it. And still, it is interesting to see how much they did get away with. And overall, it is just as fun as any of these are on a pure entertainment level. And this movie is very entertaining. It is one of the best in the series in that department. Like I said, this is the Dewey and Gale show for essentially all of its runtime, who I think are the most fun, endearing characters the series has ever produced outside of Billy and Stu. Sydney's great, I love her. But most main characters are more of a blank slate to project your own identity onto, whereas side characters often are allowed to have more personality to their motivations and mannerisms, because that's less of an issue there. But it is their movie through and through. Honestly, Sydney doesn't even need to be here, because aside from a couple of scenes, she's mostly just sitting around for most of the movie, waiting for the final conflict in the third act to start up. She's a character who really is charismatic, but weirdly the film just dies every time we cut back to her in this one, which is a real shame. For me, this is where this couple really begins to have a fun dynamic that would carry the franchise for essentially three movies. Their relationship buds in part two, but by the beginning of three they've already broken up and are forced by circumstance into working together on this case. And then they're married in four and then separated again in five like Tom Cruise alternating long and short hair for the Mission Impossible movies. I love to watch her subtle character changes as these go on. Dewey's sweetness really changes her character for the better and brings out her base humanity, which has been buried through her desire for fame and money in the first two films. There's a definite attempt at an arc that I really appreciate. We watch her go from a bloodthirsty true crime capitalist, which never fully goes away, but she does, over time, slowly learn the impact of her own actions. And we watch her actually become a caring person, who even hugs Sydney when she sees her at the police station, something which even catches Sydney off guard. 
That change is the emotional theme that part three is built off of. And without that, and the film set of stab setting, this would have been a much worse film, so I'm really glad they decided to include those elements here. Sadly, the film received poor reviews, with the most common ones saying that the trick had been played out by this point, and everyone had gotten it. What was once fresh was now no longer, and the series had devolved into becoming the very films parodied in the original Scream, and many felt that the magic that brought the first film together, which could still be felt in the second outing, was missing in this one. And for a time, that was the end of Scream, as it seemed the series had culturally fizzled out. It wouldn't be for another 11 years before we would receive Scream 4, which is almost seen as the middle bridge period between the two trilogies of the series. But it would be only eight years before the film was announced, meaning that it was in various stages of development for three years, which I'm fairly certain is the longest in the franchise. The Weinstein Company announced that Scream 4 would be happening in July of 2008, but their announcement was vague to say the least, implying that Craven nor Williamson would be returning, and also that the film was going to be a total reboot and not feature the original cast from the first trilogy. When asked about this, Craven said that he would be willing to come back and make their new Scream movie for them, so long that it was agreed upon in advance, that the script would be up to the same level as the first one had been, and that they would have the completed script locked down before production ever began to avoid what happened on parts two and three. In early 2010, it was announced that Craven would indeed be returning to direct the fourth film in the series, and that it would again be written by Williamson on his break in between seasons of his CW show, The Vampire Diaries. In usual fashion, there were a great deal of changes mandated by the Weinsteins. In the original script, Gail and Dewey had a baby together. This was cut to decrease the budget needed for an on-set baby. There was originally a two-year time jump in the middle of the film, where Sydney would be left dead by this film's ghost face and then survive, only to recover from her wounds slowly and then come back for revenge. This was cut to make the film feel faster and more cohesive. The minor roles of Chloe and Rachel, played by Kristen Bell and Anna Paquin, were originally written for Paris Hilton and Lindsay Lohan, but this idea was also scrapped for budgetary reasons. They also controversially changed the ending of the film from the original script, as this essentially got the same treatment that Exorcist 3 had. They added an entire extra climax to the end of the story to remove any ambiguity. You see Jill, this film's ghost face, was originally to be taken in an ambulance at the end of the film after seemingly killing off our main cast, including Sydney. But the twist would be that Sydney would survive, and when she would wake up, she'd no longer remember who was under the ghost face mask with a follow-up film being one built off of dramatic irony, in that we know who Ghostface is, but she does not. Rumor has it that Williamson was so upset over this mandated change in the ending that it eventually was what led him to leaving the film and the franchise permanently, being replaced by Scream 3's Kruger. When asked about this, Craven said, Look, I signed up to do a script by Kevin, and unfortunately that didn't go all the way through the shooting. But it certainly is Kevin's script and concepts and characters and themes. But despite Williamson leaving, this was the most smooth production of the franchise since the first outing. Hayden Panettiere was frustrated by the changes that happened to her character during this script shuffling and reportedly almost quit the project, but ultimately stayed on and remains an important player in the franchise. The Weinsteins did ask for a week of reshoots to tighten up two scenes that they felt were kind of weak. But outside of that, this was the first time that everything had gone as intended, more or less. After making the first Scream film, David Arquette and Courtney Cox had gotten married, but filed for separation in October of 2010, just one month after the production of Scream 4 ended. And reportedly, the two were tense throughout the production and did not interact unless required to do so. But both remained professional and did not let that impact the day-to-day -day business of making the film. There are some changes to the way that this was done this time around, as it now is being done in a different time with new sensibilities. This marked the first time that the ghost face mask appeared on a poster for a Scream movie, which is actually kind of shocking when you think about it. But it also makes a bit of sense as to how this happened, as the posters for two and three were trying to recapture that energy from the first film's poster. It is also the first in the series to use CGI, as for safety reasons as well as practical ones, the knife in this film is completely computer-generated, except for in a few shots. 
This now allows the crew to be able to show the knife actually entering someone for the first time, instead of trying to hide the stab in the edit. This does not harm the film. If you did not know this, then you probably would have never noticed it. It's just interesting information. It also is the only film in the series to not feature the song Red Right Hand by Nick Cave, which is a bit of a shame as I think it's a fun addition to see when and where and how the song will appear in each movie. One change that isn't made, however, is that this continues the streak of not having subtitles in the franchise, opting for simple numbers for each sequel, making it one of the only series ever to have a theatrical fourth film that was simply titled Four. This time, the film focuses on the weekend of the 15th anniversary of the killings from the original film, as the people who were involved in that incident return to town just in time for a new copycat Ghostface killer to begin attacking people at the local high school where it all began, reigniting the cycle of violence that had been put to rest for almost 10 years. There's an undercurrent here that I really resonate with in that Sydney writes and publishes a book that is her life story, dealing with the rounds of different Ghostface killers. And there's a bit of a conversation going on about the nature of cannibalizing your own work and personal interests for content creation in order to stay relevant on the internet. Sydney is at a crossroads where she can either leave all of this behind, live a normal life and start over fresh, or she could stay Sydney Prescott, the survivor of the Woodsboro murders. She could stay nationally known, capitalize on the trauma that has happened to her, and be famous. You know, once someone has a taste for working in the public eye, for some it is hard to go back to living an anonymous existence. And Sydney would rather publish this book and rise up old ghosts than face what that uncertainty might look like. And this ties through the climax as well, with the killers making their very own homemade stab sequel, so that they too, like Sydney Prescott, can become famous from all of this and live the life that she has. Their whole goal is to just take her place. Jill has this great line in relation to that. You had your 15 minutes, now I want mine. I mean, what am I supposed to do? Go to college, grad school, work, look around. We all live in public now. We're all on the internet. How do you think people become famous anymore? You don't have to achieve anything. You just gotta have fucked up shit happen to you. Her looks of joy verging on sexual ecstasy as reporters bombard her with questions as she's being taken away at the end of the film on the stretcher is a final note to that theme. And honestly, one of the strongest moments in the entire franchise. The whole movie is just kind of asking, what if a teenager was very stupid to the point of putting the lives of a whole town's population at risk? And I love it for that. I also love how delightfully dated this movie has become. The intro sequence, which always in some way revolves around a telephone, this time has the killer sending text on their state-of-the-art camera flip phone. We later see some very early iPhones as well with the wealthy kids, both of which tie into the idea of YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, and the new fame of the internet world. This is my personal favorite intro in the series, probably even over the first one, just because of the bag that it pulls over the audience's head. It gives us two characters that are walking cliches, that immediately stride directly into danger and are killed off with next to no buildup or suspense. It, on the surface, seems like the worst opening that they could possibly come up with. But then, the camera zooms out and we're actually with a group of teenagers watching a rented copy of Stab 6. And they talk about how bad these sequels are becoming, that are being churned out yearly for endless profits. And then one of them stabs the other one, and it turns out that's actually the intro for Stab 7 that a different group of teenagers are watching. It is a genuinely perfect example of self-parody done with a commentary purpose. Saul didn't exist yet when Scream 3 was released, and by the time we get to Scream 4, they were already on Saw 7, which is kind of insane. What I love about Scream 4 is that it returns to what the first one did so well, and stands as an actual critique of the state of the genre in particular being against the splatter and so-called torture porn movies of the 2000s. Horror had changed significantly for a decade. There was a 10-year span of time between Scream 3 and Scream 4, to being a much more ugly, darker, and more nihilistic place that movements like French Extremity thrived in. And that left a lot of room for them to be able to actually say something that mattered, which, I'm sorry, but is kind of unique for a Scream movie to do. All of the sequels are guilty at providing meditations on half-thought ideas at best. 
This was something that was, at this point, a legacy series, using its status and older style of storytelling and filmmaking to examine what was going on at the time within its own space and community. And its use of hyperviolence is a reflection of that, as this is by far the most blood-soaked Scream movie that we have ever gotten. Ghostface on the phone is also the most vulgar that he has ever been, at one point telling Sydney that he's going to slice off her eyelids so that she can't close them and will be forced to watch him do the things that he has planned for her. Which these critiques honestly do at times ring a bit hollow, considering Craven's involvement in the remakes of The Hills Have Eyes, as those films are extremely in line with that specific brand of 2000s horror. But the less I ever say on The Hills Have Eyes again, the better. In addition to all of this meta-horror commentary, Anthony Anderson joins the cast after playing in the scary movie franchise that directly parodied Scream, which I absolutely love what an Ouroboros of a circle that makes. But unfortunately, this cleverness that Scream 4 has in its decisions is very front-loaded, as in the back half it just sort of devolves into more repetitions of what we've seen before, with a message on the obsession on the first film as we have people screaming and cheering while watching that same movie yet again. It is the reason that I have less to say on this film out of any of the screams, because even though I do like it a lot, in the second and third acts, it is retreading a lot of the ground that we've been before. It's a great movie, it is a lot of fun, and a good return to the series that proved that they still had what it takes to make these. But outside of its continuing story with these characters that we know, there isn't a lot going on below the hood that we are at this point not familiar with. And to a degree, you know, this is on purpose. It is a movie about sequels and remakes and repetitions and the cyclical nature of film and things like that, but still. And speaking of character moments, there is a small bit of characterization in this that is one of my favorites in the series. As we go from Sydney punching Gale when they first meet, to them growing as people and Gail surprising Sydney with a hug at a later date, to this film where they approach each other in open arms as friends like it's nothing. It is a clear non-verbal arc completed in this hug that I just absolutely adore. They are 100% on the same team from that moment on, even into the further films. This is by no means a complaint, but in being a product of its time, this is the only Scream movie that visually distanced itself from the established look of the franchise all the way from the first movie on up to present day, each of these follow the visual tone that the first one built up. The most recent two are a little dark, but still follow the visual rules for the most part, as it is, you know, still well lit, and isn't as drastic of a departure of what 4 does, in that most of these shots are slightly too drastically overexposed, and the outdoor backgrounds are usually blown out to where you can't see a lot of detail at all. Headlights and lamps flare huge streaks on the frame, and stylistically, it makes this movie feel just slightly different than the others, and I don't really know why this was done, other than the fact that J.J. Abrams' 2009 Star Trek film famously had just popularized the lens flare sleek, overly lit blockbuster that would stick around for a few years. Although this might just be a coincidence and was done for different reasons. Who knows? I do prefer the look of the other movies compared to this, but I also don't mind the new style either. As part of his contract with the making of Scream 4, the option was on the table to make 5 and 6 as a new trilogy if that movie had done well at the box office, which it sadly did not do the numbers that they had hoped for. In fact, it performed the worst out of any in the franchise to date. Not that it did exceptionally poorly, but it was determined that it did not pull the kind of numbers that would be needed to justify a new trilogy. But despite this, Craven did seem interested in returning again, saying that he wanted to do it, but that he was tired of being frustrated about trying to figure out the films as they went along due to the complications surrounding the writing process, and that he would not direct another Scream film without a completed script like he'd done for three entries in a row now. Which is a pretty fair thing to be mad about as a filmmaker. It is kind of shocking and also a testament to Craven's skill as a director that those movies turned out the way that they did considering the circumstances. For a time, it seemed as if a part five was possible despite the box office failings of the fourth movie. In particular, because it seems Harvey Weinstein was a personal fan of these movies and enjoyed them to the point that he didn't mind losing some money on a possible fifth project if it meant that they might have another chance at renewed success. But then, as it usually happens, things got rocky. 
Apparently, Kevin Williamson and Wes Craven had such a falling out behind closed doors after the production of Four over Williamson's non-traditional writing style that they stopped talking completely. And then separately, MTV started development on their Scream television series adaptation. And on top of that, Wes Craven would sadly pass away at the age of 76 on August 30th, 2015, leaving behind a legacy that no one could ever touch. Scream 4 would end up being his final film. As for the series, we're not going to be covering that here. I've avoided doing franchises in the past that had a television component to them, like Bates Motel and the Psycho Universe. I don't really like TV, I'm a movie guy. This thing exists, you can go watch it, but we're just gonna skip over it. Then, even though it was obviously a necessary and good thing to happen, more disastrous news happened for the franchise, with the fall of the Weinsteins. All of this together seemed to signal that Scream would be over for good, following the Me Too movement and the eventual bankruptcy of the Weinstein Company. Jason Blom swooped in immediately to try and purchase the rights to take over the Scream franchise, which, you know, thank God that didn't happen. He has, it seems, been slowly trying to collect all of the legacy franchises if he can, and just looking at how his Halloween movies and the new Exorcist turned out, he just needs to be stopped from getting any more of them. Then things started moving fast. In March of 2020, it was announced that Radio Silence was chosen to be the team to develop the first non-Wes Craven, Kevin Williamson Scream movie that was going to be released through Spyglass, which is one of the most complicated jobs that any horror filmmaker has ever had to take on. They're unique in that they're a team of people and not a single entity, which is, you know, a little unorthodox, but obviously works for them. After their success with working on films like Southbound, the VHS movies, and Ready or Not, they were a great pick, with Ready or Not obviously being the deciding factor on if they could do something like this. They had been at this time in the midst of developing Cocaine Bear as their next project, which they abandoned to take this on instead. Like everything in that time though, this was heavily affected by COVID and the film would not actually see theaters until January of 2022, despite being filmed earlier in 2020. This actually is far and away my second favorite Scream film in the franchise which considering the high bar that Craven set in his own films is saying something. They knew that they had a legacy to live up to and at least in my book, they met and exceeded all expectations I had for this project. And if the movie could be summed in one word, it would be legacy. This movie is kind of weirdly more about The Force Awakens than it is with any other specific horror movie in particular. We start with a familiar setting and world, but further into the future than we've ever seen with a new cast comprised of younger people and a female lead. And then slowly as the world and story unfolds, we bring in the older cast members who have dealt with this before from the first films in still important but distinctly supporting roles rather than the starring ones they once had. By this point, not all that unlike the Skywalker family, this movie fully cements Scream as being about the continued trauma of the extended generations of the Loomis family as well as the impact of what happened to that community all those years ago. As we learn that our new protagonist, Sam, is the secret biological daughter of Billy from the first movie. I do, however, wish they'd chosen a different first name for her because her being Sam Loomis is a little too on the nose for me. We also have Chad and Mindy, who are the children of Martha from Scream 3, who was the sister of Randy from the first film. And not only that, but Ghostface in this movie is targeting the descendants and relatives of those who were attached to the original Woodsboro killers. And this legacy extends into the casting as well, not just in bringing back David Arquette, Courtney Cox, and Neve Campbell, but also just the fact that Jack Quaid is the son of Dennis Quaid and Meg Ryan, and Mason Gooding is the son of Cuba Gooding Jr. There's a theme in this film that is also extended through its casting on the passage of time, and with that, the metaphorical torch. To a degree, it is also riffing on films like the 2018 reboot of Halloween. But this, in structure and style, with its focus on familial history, is clearly most built off the new Star Wars films. And without Force Awakens, I don't know if we would have even gotten legacy films like Halloween 2018 in the style that we got them. But on that, I think that this new Scream is very smart and that it is a commentary on legacy sequels without fully committing to being one of them. In all of those movies, only the first film is canon. But this is not a full-on reboot, and every previous film does still exist within this timeline. The one thing that they clearly knew they had to get right this time around is this intro. 
These opening few minutes would be what the film was defined and judged by, just like the first film was. And I think they really knock this out of the park. You could strike a mark against it for the fact that it is exceptionally derivative of that film's opening, which would be fair. But this is also a purposeful, intentional thing that they are making fun of here, in this movie, and it allows them to get away with things that they might otherwise not. Structurally, Force Awakens was a soft remake of A New Hope. Halloween, a soft remake of Halloween. And in turn, Scream is a soft remake of Scream. So a lot of what this movie is doing should be considered as parody that mostly averts any criticisms I would normally have. And just the filmmaking here is really suspenseful and strong. Like, it is a bit daring to try and throw your hat into the ring with one of the most famous scenes in horror film history. And then not only come out alive, but pull it off decently well. It's not better, but they didn't embarrass themselves either. So many little moments where a camera goes around a corner, or a cabinet is shut where you expect Ghostface may be hiding, but then he isn't. They use this same technique later in the film when Wes is casually walking around the house, unaware of what's going on while the music swells to great effect. It's just very restrained in how it sets up the scares and doesn't give you the satisfaction on delivering on them yet as the calls from the killer get more and more uncomfortable. I absolutely love that Roger L. Jackson gets to stretch his legs as a voice actor in this scene. One of the things that made the original intro so good is how natural and relaxed he is as Ghostface on the phone at first, and how the conversation slowly turns obscene and graphic. I think there's a really uncomfortable aspect of social horror, where a stranger who seems nice suddenly says something absolutely filthy and obscene to you. It creates such an awful feeling that this is building a nest and living inside of. In all of the other movies, the second someone picks up the phone, he's immediately hostile and sinister. And with the voice, he can make it work, but the character in past films is undeniably one note. This is the only time in the franchise, other than that original scene, where he actually gets to play with a bit of nuance to his performance, and it makes it all the more disturbing. This also is an unusual intro scene for the series in that the victim lives. Scream is constantly about upending expectations, and this movie starts with a really big example of how to do that well. Which, they're super lucky that they made that decision because Jenna Ortega was not yet Jenna Ortega when they made this. And now they have a franchise where she's one of the leads. Not that Scream needed it, but it certainly did help. We are then introduced to the new cast, which I really like for the most part, but I do have some minor complaints. I've seen a lot of racism directed at the new Scream films for its mostly non-white cast, and I really hate to see that. It isn't fair to the performers and is generally shameful. My issues are not on their performance or their very existence or what they look like, but instead on the writing and material that they're given. I don't want any complaints to be construed as racism because that has been a constant conversation around these films. As good as the filmmaking is in these, I think the scripts hold both the new Scream films back a little bit. And I'm talking about dialogue and character writing here, and not plot. I think the plot of at least this first one, to be the most considered and cared for since the first movie. The dialogue isn't bad by any stretch of the imagination, in fact, I would say that it's mostly good. I did say after all that this was my second favorite Scream film, but their character work and way that they speak at times is a bit flat and uninteresting. Scream has a very particular style of heightened camp dialogue and acting that this never quite hits and they talk almost like the characters would in the more naturalistic movies that these are supposed to be making fun of. Every time the characters talk about being the core four in the sequel, I cringe a little. Scream has always been a character-driven franchise. It lives and dies by how much you enjoy spending time with these people, and while I would say their performances are good across the board, they ultimately are only doing the best they can in elevating what is at times fairly weak material. And I actually don't see it as a massive problem in this film, more so that it starts to be a problem here, and then really gets exceptionally worse in the next sequel. One other minor thing, that if you've watched me long enough, you'll know that I can't stand referential character names. We already covered Sam Loomis in this one. It'll always be distracting, and you've got a fair amount of that going on with these new characters. With the main protagonist Sam Loomis's birth name, Samantha Carpenter, obviously named after John Carpenter, and Wes being named after Wes Craven which was super distracting while trying to get immersed in the film. Although I will say that after Wes is killed, they toast to his memory, and all the voices yelling to Wes are people who worked on past Scream films, which is nice, but is just another example of Scream doing jarring things that get in front of them telling an actual story. 
Also, speaking of character work, I do love that this entry does something better than any other Scream film did, which is to give plausible hints of doubt to everyone in the main cast. This film is fueled by paranoia. The tagline for this famously accompanied an image of the entire cast and read, The killer is on this poster. Such a great little marketing idea. I love a gimmick. And throughout the runtime, there's little hints that different characters could or could not be the killer, just by exhibiting normal things associated with their lives. Is Chad Ghostface, or does he really just have bruises on his arm from football practice? It is basic murder mystery 101 kind of stuff. It should be obvious, but the other films were largely uninterested in engaging with this kind of storytelling, and I'm so glad that they brought this in here. The fact that it is a half reboot helps with this as well though, as it allows them space to play in because we are thrown into a very unfamiliar cast of people. Also, I love that we get scenes where both of our Ghostface killers are in danger, a ruse to get the others in the film off their scent, as well as us as the audience. In the other films except for the first one, the mask reveal kind of comes out of left field. It happens and for a moment you're left with this feeling of, alright, I guess it can be them, sure. But in this one, it is genuinely exciting because you have theories while watching it. The writers give you actual clues and red herrings to follow and willingly want you to actively mentally participate in this game that they're building for you. The Scream movies are actually kind of difficult for me to write about at length because they are so plot driven. I don't really like talking about the events of a story within a review if I can help it, as I think going beat by beat through what happens on screen is bad criticism and kind of boring for both me and for you. But sometimes you hit these pieces of popcorn media that offers the most substance in their plot and that is hard to reckon with critically. This starts to play out as you would expect. People start to die off, and our primary group of teenagers band together to try and figure out just what's happening here, getting paired up with our old protagonist along the way. I know that Mindy, the horror film fanatic niece of Randy from the first film, is supposed to be a bit annoying on purpose, and in that fills the same role that he did in that movie, but as a character, I think she works a lot less than he did. As these go along, the scenes where they talk about horror movie tropes and how that relates to what's happening to them becomes less and less necessary and eye roll inducing. Because the first one did it, every subsequent Scream movie feels as if they too need a sermon on the state of horror movies slapped haphazardly into the middle of the script. And I would argue that not only do these movies not need this, but also that they never really did. It feels organic in the first one, purposeful but is handled super clunky in pretty much all of the rest of them, including this one. And I kind of hope that future Scream titles just decide to drop this aspect, unless there's a genuine organic reason to include it, because at this point we get it, and we don't really need to hear it again unless they do something really creative. Like, for instance, having a whole film take place at a horror convention that is celebrating the Stab films. I also think this could have been done a bit more clever instead of just rehashing the first one. As a result of the original Scream, so many popular movies within horror no longer play by the same rules that they used to, and they could have dived into that a bit more. It's a thing that's kind of defined a subset of this recent era of horror cinema, but outside of a single joke about the witch in the opening of the film, and a few half-hearted mentions of elevated horror, this doesn't really engage with that kind of conversation all that much, which is kind of a shock because the jokes really should write themselves here. They weirdly also include Jordan Peele in this when they're talking about elevated horror, whom I've always seen as a bit of a more blockbuster horror kind of guy. I've never really heard him mentioned in association with those kinds of pieces, and at least to me almost signals a misunderstanding of what people meant when they used to say elevated horror, or maybe I never fully understood it. As the term was to my ears, used for much cheaper and slower art house style films than he makes. To me, I always thought when people said that, they were talking about things like Beyond the Black Rainbow, The Winch, We're All Going to the World's Fair, Skinamarink, and Under the Skin. I know Nope wasn't out yet, but Us certainly was and that movie cost $20 million. I think if they had to include a bit about horror movies because it is Scream, then it was a bit of a missed opportunity to not explore this as I do think that there was a way to examine the discussions happening in modern genre spaces that this misses the mark on pretty exceptionally. But at the same time, I don't entirely mind this scene too much. It is a little goofy, sure, but also a cornerstone of the franchise has always been teenage cringe. There's nothing here that is actually worse than Billy's speech in the first film about 
how his relationship with Sydney used to be NC-17, but lately had felt like it was censored for TV. And luckily, it is only one quick scene, and not a pervasive ghost that lingers over the whole film. Ghostface and the kills themselves in this are great. I absolutely love the shade of red used for the blood in this daylight scene, when Martha is killed. That whole sequence where she is baited into going home because she believes her son to be in danger is malicious and fantastic. The CGI knife returns here again in this and is honestly really good. It makes the kill scenes feel so much more intimate and personal in a really horrible way. The particular level of violence is a new feeling to Scream that really wasn't in the original three, but it works within the context of the film. I also do love that Richie, the ghost face in this film, just casually sits in bed by himself eating pizza and watching dead meat videos on the stab movies for research purposes. This is genuinely very funny and is actually probably the only time that the movie has a meaningful moment on commentary on the state of modern horror and how the internet and content creation industry has affected the genre. This time around, Ghostface's motive for killing is to save the stab movies as Richie and Amber feel the films have lost their way, and if they were to start up new killings again, they might give Hollywood some original ideas on how a good stab movie should be made. And this is pretty fun, and ties into ideas of toxic fandom, and our new internet age of art being made to pander to the babies who can cry the loudest. Ryan Johnson is mentioned by name earlier in the film, which is a huge clue as to where this is going thematically. So, even though in style the movie is modeled after something like Force Awakens, in commentary, it is much more focused on the internet's reaction and implosion in the wake of the release of The Last Jedi, and the rise of toxic male-dominated fandom groups that can pitch enough fits and make enough noise to get creators fired and have dumb things like the Snyder Cut made. It ends up being not only a worthy thought process that earns the film its Scream name, but actually is probably the best and most logical reason that a ghost faces killing in the entire franchise. I love everything about this, especially the unhinged violence that Sam is shown to be capable of here at the end. This is the first time that we have a protagonist like this, and I kind of love her for it. But even though I generally absolutely love most of what this movie's doing, there's a few other things here that I do have some small issues with. First of all, I really hate the pseudo-supernatural force ghost-like mental illness visions of Billy from the first movie. They don't work at all for me, and actively harm the film for several reasons. For being one of my favorite movies in the franchise, this is my least favorite creative decision that any of these films have made. To me, this inclusion makes zero sense. And worse is that it doesn't add anything. I think the worst thing that a legacy sequel can do is include elements such as iconic lines, shots, clothing items, twists, just to serve as callbacks to remind us of the original that we love, and hopefully make us love this one by manipulation proxy. And in that, it makes these inclusions feel devoid of actual real substance. A joke has been made about boxing being included in The New Exorcist, just because Father Karras boxed for exercise in the original film. And this isn't quite that bad, but it still is the storytelling equivalent of jangling keys in my face to try and make me clap and giggle. And I really hate to see it, it is generally insulting. I would say that overall I think this movie is mostly clever. At times, I do also think that it can be a bit weak in execution of some of its ideas. As I said, if there was a comparison to be made, it would be how The Force Awakens is kind of a worse but still good and serviceable version of A New Hope, which is definitely the realm of filmmaking that they are purposefully playing with here, and allows the film to get away with some tropey writing that it otherwise may not, in a more standalone adventure. It is something that I don't necessarily mind in this entry because it is kind of what the film is about but I would hate it in the next one because they don't really have an excuse to rely on that anymore. I really think they're playing with the death of Han Solo with Dewey's kill scene in this movie. It almost acts as a direct parody of what happened there, but that doesn't make me like it. It's the only scene in the film that I would describe as being outright bad because it crosses two lines. One is that it just doesn't make a lot of sense, and two, I don't think that Dewey would actually do this in this situation as based on his actions in the previous films. Okay, so the gang has narrowly escaped an injured ghost face and have gotten onto an elevator. And when this elevator is about to close and go down, he last minute decides that he has to get out to make sure that he finishes ghost face off and to buy them some time to get away. And even though he has a gun, he gets within arm's length and then gets killed, which just feels lazy. I don't buy it. 
I think it is great to kill legacy characters, I don't have a problem with them killing him off at all, but this doesn't feel earned. And the scene afterwards of Gale crying just doesn't hit like it should because we're cheated a good death for a character that we've known for about 25 years. On that note, I don't really know how to explain or really articulate this, or even if it is this movie that the transformation fully happens in, as it actually might more so be the next one. But at some point in the series, Gale stops being Gale in my mind and slowly just turns into Courtney Cox. I know that she's being played by Courtney Cox the whole time, obviously, but around this part of the series, it feels less like she's playing a dedicated character and more like she's just here and people are calling her Gale. She's not bad, but she's definitely giving a weird energy that is disconnected from what she was giving earlier in the franchise, at least to me. Gale had this intense career-driven sternness that is sort of gone here. All of this builds to a climax that is a fun commentary on that original film's ending, and the series and horror at large. And like the first one, it is probably the best section of the movie, as it is revealed that the party that is being thrown in Wes's memory happens to actually be the old mocker home from the first film, with a stage being set of a similar rampage that mirrors that first one. I love how, as filmmakers, they try to shoot this space that we intimately know in particular angles with party lighting, so that we don't guess that we're in the original house from the first movie. It didn't work on me, and I wonder the percentage of people that it did. Not that there's much they could do to hide it, but they do try, like moving the beer fridge to the basement instead of the famous garage, and stuff like that. Now, part of this doesn't work in that, how do these characters not know that this is Stu Mocker's house? Wouldn't that be like the one location in town that everyone would be familiar with? similar to the Marston house in Salem's Lot. I think most of the sequence works pretty well, except for the bits where they really should be aware of the danger that is around them. Like when they recreate the Randy attack scene by having his niece watch the film adaptation of him being attacked in the same room that it happened in. She has watched this movie so many times. She knows this house. She lives in this town. And having her getting attacked and ambushed is a bit of a betrayal of her intelligence. I really appreciate the line where Richie asks, who has a party in the middle of a killing spree? Knowing full and well that he is the killer, but just enjoying playing the role of the clueless bystander, but also commenting on the logic of the first scream. And then the subsequent fighting that occurs as the chaos ensues is really well done here. I will say though, that a knock against this is that by the end of the first scream, everyone has lost so much blood due to their excessive wounds that they're all lightheaded and realistically probably only have a very limited amount of time left to live. I love that about Scream. I love how every single hit that these people take actually causes damage and impacts their ability to fight in the final act. Every single injury matters and takes a toll on these people. But here at the end of this one, we have people who have suffered fatal injuries who should be being rushed to the hospital, just hanging out and having conversations while the ambulance people casually wait for them to be done. Gail has a bullet in her gut that got practically fisted not 10 minutes earlier, but they're just so casual about how this conversation about what her next book is going to be about has to happen before any of these things can be addressed. It kind of ruins it for me. They're acting like this is being done over some morning coffee. That's the energy that they're giving to this scene. It is genuinely awful, and verges on being extremely silly in a negative way, and I couldn't stop thinking about it and actually focus on the moment the first time that I saw this in theaters. But weirdly, despite my many criticisms, this movie just has an endearing quality to it that makes me look past these things and still enjoy it for what it is. I think it's a very fun entry and worthy of the Scream name. Taking this job on was something that I would never envy. Scream fans are so devoted to this thing that any new works are going to be scrutinized under the sharpest of microscopes. It'd be like if a new team decided to make a sequel to Bloodborne. And I think they actually rose to the challenge and proved that people other than Craven and Williamson can make quality Scream films, while also honoring what those guys did before them. This movie was obviously a massive success, not only at the box office, but also in that it reignited Scream merchandise. I don't have a figure, but the amount of things that have been sold that have Ghostface on them has to be astronomical. They have probably made more money on that stuff than they have on the actual movies. And I guess we're doing the 80s again, because a sequel was ordered from the same team with a one year turnaround time, as we received Scream 6 in March of this year. This is the movie that proudly proclaimed extensively in all of the marketing that we are not in Woodsboro anymore despite the fact that most of the films don't even take place in Woodsboro to begin with, and that this is now a New York movie. 
And let me tell you one thing, this is not a New York movie. Everything outside of the subway scene could have taken place in a small town or anywhere. And even that one really didn't specifically have to be in New York. It is so bizarre to me to have your opening kill take place in an alleyway in a city that is famous for having almost zero alleyways. There are so few alleys in New York that almost every alley scene in film history in the city was filmed in the same one. It's not that there aren't any, but there are so few that it is such a prominent feel to that city that opening your New York horror movie this way does not bode well for the accuracy of tone to the chosen setting for the rest of the picture. Plus. What professional woman would walk down an alleyway at night to begin with, to meet a man that she has only ever spoken to on the phone and has never met before, who was also late to their date? The sequence doesn't work on multiple levels. This signals from the very beginning that the very thing that the film was marketed on was a false promise. And this movie was heavily marketed on its New York setting. But the thing is that they didn't even put up the money to have this be filmed in New York, and ended up being shot entirely in Canada with a few drone stock shots mixed in with a couple more CGI backdrops to try and sell the illusion. Which just leaves the film to having a very unfortunately strange feel that is very pervasive across the entire runtime. It is also why pretty much every outdoor scene is shot with such a shallow depth of field to where only the character that we're supposed to be looking at is in focus because they're trying to hide the fact that none of this feels like that city. They do other silly things as well to try and sell the location falsely, like having the main detective who has supposedly grown up here his entire life have a little Statue of Liberty in his office like he's a tourist, which is just something that would almost certainly just never happen. At least Jason Takes Manhattan had the decency to do a couple of days actually in New York so that we could see Jason in Times Square, but nothing in this film comes even close to that. And like, they even include a shot from that movie in this one as someone is watching it on television. And of all the movies to want to remind your audience of, that is a very strange one to pick, especially if you were to risk falling in the same holes that that one did. A big issue of these sequels is that they use their meta commentary as a shield from criticism. And by this point, it just doesn't work anymore. This opening, however, does have some great ideas that it's playing with, that it unfortunately has no interest in following through with. The first is that our opening kill is on a character that we've never met before, played by horror icon Samara Weaving, who fulfills a similar bait and switch role to this movie that Drew Barrymore did back in the original. But what I love here is that normally as soon as the kill was over, we would cut to the logo of the film. But instead, the camera just sits on him as he breathes heavily, physically recovering from this exertion. It's a weirdly human moment that we don't get to typically see in these films. And then he even takes his mask off and we're allowed to see his face. We learn he is friends with a character that we already know. We see that he has a shrine in his home dedicated to the Stab films. And it seems for a moment that we're going to be given a Scream movie fueled entirely on dramatic irony that fulfills the original intended promise of the fourth film's ending, where we know who Ghostface is the entire time and the joy of it is watching the characters enter a field of open danger that we are aware of but they are not which is a fascinating idea to try and form one of these around to shake up that formula of what a Scream movie can be. It is such a good idea, but then his phone rings and a different ghost face is on the line who kills him before he can ever actually affect the movie in any interesting way. He might as well have just not been in the film at that point. We could have had two ghost face killers who were both operating in competition against each other who don't know each other's identity, one who we know and one who we don't a mix of both new and familiar territory within Scream. Bringing this idea into the film is a Pandora's box of great paths that they could have taken, and they don't go down any of them, instead deciding to just kill that idea off and do more of what we've seen before. It teases a more interesting movie than this movie is in itself, which is like a cardinal sin in writing. I know this wasn't done purposefully as commentary, but I do find it very funny that we have a second Scream 2 that was rushed into production to make it into theaters the next year. And that isn't the only way that this film mirrors Scream 2. And that this one also follows our previous characters from a high school to college in a new setting. It is essentially just a soft remake of 2, including full on copying scenes from that movie, such as the one in the park where Ghostface is watching them while talking on the phone. And things that I let slide in their first outing really stick out to me as negatives this time around. 
I really wish that they had longer to work on this, because there are cracks all over this thing, and I really don't think that a lot of the issues would have been here if they did not rush the film's release so much. So we start with getting some character drama re-establishing the relationships of these characters that we know, including a very welcome return of Hayden Panettiere's Kirby, plus some new faces that we don't, and Ghostface killings inevitably start back up again, throwing their lives into disarray. This actually comes pretty late into the film compared to other entries in the Scream franchise, with them realizing that they are in danger over half an hour into the runtime. But once things take off, this plays out like more of a horror action film than any of the others have in the past. From then on, it is essentially non-stop set pieces for the whole film's run, which is a lot of fun. But we have less of a mystery here going on than in any of the others. And I would argue that as a result, it has the weakest Ghostface reveal out of the franchise. But we'll get to that in a moment. In this opening, and sprinkled throughout the whole film, something that I really appreciate about this movie is that it focuses on the fact that these people have been through an incredibly difficult time, and have grown and become stronger through that. The core four stuff is kind of awful, almost as bad as the evil dies tonight catchphrase. But underneath that is this tone, that even through hardships, you don't have to let your soul be defeated by people who want to steal your happiness. And ultimately, I do love that about this one. This action is set off with the bodega scene, which is fantastic. It is the strongest and most intense bit of filmmaking that they offer in this one, and is reason enough to watch the film. Them hiding in a very small closed space while he's ducking around corners with a shotgun is just excellently done. It is hard to make a gun actually scary in a horror film, which is odd, as someone pulling a gun on you in real life is about the scariest thing that a person could do. But we have gotten so normalized to seeing them on screen that they don't have the impact that they should. And the fact that they were able to remove that desensitization and bring fear into it is something that I think doesn't get enough credit for. Which is something that they work to establish by showing how messy a shotgun kill would be at the beginning of the scene with the clerk. I know people got mad about this because supposedly Ghostface doesn't use a gun. But Ghostface isn't a single person. He's different every time around. And Scream is based on trying to not meet your expectations, but instead do original things. And I would say this is a very original and very scary moment for the film. It calls to mind the similar excellent shotgun bodega scene in Maniac Cop 2. And I wonder if that was in their mind when making this. This is also about the only scene in this franchise where sound is an overwhelmingly key feature. As they're trying to make their way to the door without alerting attention. And this is always great. Sound should be more important in the movies and the shows that we make, but the set piece action scenes like this in this film, such as this, and the one where Gail gets attacked in her apartment, are in my opinion among the very best in the series. And even if I'm mixed on a lot of the other writing decisions going on in this, I can at least say that they nailed that aspect of the movie. Although they do do the thing that they did with the last movie with Dewey, where Gail leaves the safety of her panic room that she built in case she was ever attacked by Ghostface, so that she can go for a one-on-one -on -one with Ghostface, where she inevitably gets stabbed, of course. I hate when writers stoop to lowering a character's intelligence to force things to happen within a script. There's a million creative ways they could have forced Gail out of that room that didn't rely on suddenly turning her stupid. The central idea of this could have been fascinating and make for a great film, as it revolves around a Ghostface massacre that takes place on Halloween night. There are stories about how Ghostface costumes are the most popular that people are buying on television. And in its opening act, this sets up a New York that is filled with people who are all dressed in outfits and disguises, with one of them being the killer blending in out in the open. That is such a fun concept, that would have been an opportunity to further play with this style of Halloween that the first film was so interested in but really only gets played with in the famous subway sequence, which is really great, but contains solely to this one section of the movie. Most of the kills take place indoors, and the final act takes place in one isolated location away from the city. And so because they refuse to pay to have them actually film in New York, the film can never live up to the ideas that it clearly wants to engage with. And this cheapness famously didn't end there, as this is the first Scream film that doesn't have Neve Campbell in it. She gave a price that she thought she was worth, and they refused to meet that, so she isn't here. And you can really feel her absence. People said, oh, Sydney's gone through so much, we should let that character go away gracefully. 
but this is anything but graceful. We are in an era of artists standing up for what they are owed for their craft, and her absence for that reason is a black mark on this project. She carried these movies for decades at this point, and they should have paid her what she wanted. She is Scream. And her not being in this in my eyes delegitimizes it in a fairly substantial way. But going back to the movie, the subway scene that we mentioned is another standout here. And I think they actually do sell the feel of that location pretty well and is one of the moments where it seems they spared no cost. This is, I would imagine, probably the most expensive sequence that has ever been done in a Scream film. As these subway stations and cars featured here are all a set, and the train was being pulled by a truck when it moves. Everything here, including the things flying past the windows, was all done practically, on assets that were built just for this movie, which is actually pretty cool. And the use of popular horror icons that flash quickly in the train is such a great little touch. Although, I will say that there's another very anti-New York moment in this sequence, as they get separated at one point and are texting each other to let them know that they are safe. And if you've ever been on those trains, you will know that nine times out of 10, you will momentarily lose cell service in those tunnels between stations. Just so many moments that throw me because it feels like they weren't even concerned with trying to replicate a place that most audience members who are watching this have either been to or are well familiar with. And I don't even know why they made this decision, because usually taking phones away from a character would be beneficial in trying to build a sense of stress and anxiety. This movie is actually more concerned with the most recent Halloween films than anything else, with its use of an old, cracked ghost face mask, similar to the one that Michael dons in the recent Blumhouse trilogy and the themes of reoccurring violence over time, and a woman who was a survivor but is also treated as if she's this crazed thing that needs to be outcast from society. It also ties into the film's overall messaging on franchise filmmaking, as the killer is leaving behind the masks of previous killers, as what the detectives refer to as Easter eggs. And this all mostly works, certainly more than it does within the films that they're even referencing. There's an issue that you see pop up in franchises where screenwriters feel as if they're obligated to include an element in their sequel, even if it's not appropriate or does not fit, simply because the first film did it. A good example is how the first Pumpkinhead is a meditation on revenge, and so every Pumpkinhead from then on feels like it has to make some grand statement on revenge, even when they don't have anything original to say and would have been better off just not including that element at all. Some of the best horror sequels of all time differ wildly from their predecessors, it's always a great thing to see, it's bold, but Scream's insistence on every movie having some grand meditation on the current state of horror is incredibly stale by this point. And as I said in the last one, it is something that the franchise should really leave behind in future installments. I was cringing so hard watching this sequence where the characters get together to analyze horror media for tips on who the killer might be and how they might survive this outing. It is so uncomfortable to watch that it brought the whole film down a letter grade for me. This is no exaggeration, one of the most embarrassing scenes that I've ever watched in a theater. I couldn't believe it made the final cut in this state. Really, the thing you should take away from life is that if you don't have anything to contribute to the conversation, then you just shouldn't say anything at all. To do so would only fill up space and take away from something someone else could be saying that actually matters and has perspective. Many times I've worked on videos that I was initially excited about, only to realize halfway through that what I was making was utterly pointless and had no reason to exist other than the fact that I needed money. And as a reaction to that, I always do the logical thing and stop making that video and never release it. Why waste your time or mine? And the same could be said for how the meta horror should have been handled in this that was crudely blunt forced into the script with a ball peen hammer. I am not joking when I say that this movie would have been elevated significantly just by cutting that entire section out of it. By this point, if you aren't doing anything stylistic with it, then we don't need it. Meta horror is not the sole thing that makes a Scream movie, and luckily once the scene is over, we never bring it back up again. The CGI knife returns once more, and the kills and the overall effect of it is just as good as it was before, if not better. It allows them to do shots that would be otherwise too dangerous to put an actor through like when the knife is inches away from Gale's face in their fateful struggle. And the use of that technology really does elevate these later movies. The action in these two most recent outings, the stylish way that the camera frames everything is just so nice. 
and the direction that they go with really lives up to the looks of the original films. Essentially, the entire back half of this movie takes place in a museum of previous artifacts from the franchise that we think has been collected by Ghostface, but actually was owned by Richie in the previous movie. A museum that he has slowly amassed to be almost like a church of worship. I really like this idea a lot. It takes his love of the Stab movies that essentially all of the villains have and turns it up to 11. Their drive to kill becomes so strong that it even models the environment around them. The way that they find this, though, is very off to me. Gale just somehow knows that it exists and takes them there. And when prompted about how she knows this, she just says, it's called investigative journalism, which is just weak writing shrouded in a joke. There absolutely should have been some reason that leads them to this moment. We finally learn that our three killers this time are the surviving relatives of Richie from the last film, who are out for revenge mirroring Nancy Loomis's reveal as the killer in the original Scream 2. I think all of this is both kind of awful and also highly implausible. And I really hope that a future Scream 3 doesn't take place on a movie set just because the original Scream 3 did. Let's do some new things next time, how about that? How did he get a job as a lead New York detective to pull off this scheme in a little under a year? Did he already have the job? If so, why was Richie in Woodsboro to begin with? How did he become obsessed with it in the first place? How did they afford to pay for the rent of this giant warehouse in the city on a detective's salary? It all makes no sense. It is the most lackluster ending of the series and essentially has no actual mystery build up to it, which is a massive step back from their previous film. There's no possible way that the audience can guess this unless they go into it assuming that it's going to serve as a remake of two. And unfortunately, this reverts back to the tendencies that the previous Scream sequels had. Even if this is doing this in commentary on the previous films, that doesn't mean that it should get away with it. But I will say that the ensuing action is pretty nice, just as it is in every other sequence leading up to this. And they really try to make up for the lack of surprise in the sheer intensity of it all. And it again teases that Sam is eventually going to crack in a future installment, which is kind of fun. She has a lot of horror Luke Skywalker energy to her arc on if she's going to become like her famous evil older relative, and I'm excited to see where they go with that. I love seeing her in Billy's original Ghostface outfit. It is one of the more original ideas that these two new movies have in switching up our expectations and allowing us to watch our current protagonist hunt the current Ghostface for a change, making for a great conclusion to an otherwise weaker ending. I just love how unhinged and deluded she is. That is something which is very uncommon for a horror protagonist, especially a woman protagonist. And I kinda love to see it for its originality. She stabs Wayne legitimately maybe 30 times, and then has the delusion to say that she isn't like her father, and she isn't a killer and is going to let him live. The look Tara gives to her when she says this is a perfect way to sell how funny that line is. There is a bit of a cheesy payoff in this final act to Sam and Tara's relationship that I actually do like a lot where the whole time in both of these films, Tara has told her sister that she can take care of herself and doesn't need this looming savior in her life. And here in this climax, Sam is presented with an option where she can try and save her older sister and die, or she can let go of her and trust that she's capable of handling herself in this fight. It is a silly but nice little allegorical non-verbal button on an aspect of life that is kind of difficult to thread into an action sequence successfully. And I think it's implemented pretty well here. Their relationship grows and they survive because they reach this metaphorical place of trusting each other's capabilities. This concludes the same as the last, where people who have received exceptionally life-threatening injuries hang out while they calmly talk about their feelings with each other instead of going to the hospital. I mean, look at how many times Chad was really violently stabbed, only for them to be like, oh no, are you okay? Mindy even runs in this sequence after getting several hunting knife wounds to the stomach earlier in the evening. Why is she here? Shouldn't she have been taken to the hospital when that happened? Where's she been? This really does kill me. There's no reason that these scenes couldn't take place at the hospital the next day, or why we couldn't cut to a few weeks later for this to happen. It drives me crazy. Like, the other movies do this too. Scream 4 does this. But Gail is actually acting like she's been extremely wounded in that scene, and it is taking place at a hospital. And the only logical reason that I can think why this may have been done is that the studio or producers didn't want to spend the money on building an extra set just for that one moment. But these really do kind of ruin both of the endings for me.
After the release of Scream 6, it was announced that Radio Silence would not be producing any more Scream movies, and that they would be moving on to making a new film in the Escape from New York franchise, as well as developing a reboot to the Universal Monsters, which honestly I'm extremely excited for. There is no reason why Universal should be having this hard of a time figuring out their monster line. And I really hope these guys can finally get the ball rolling for them. And in their place, it was announced that Christopher Landon would be taking over as the director for the upcoming Scream 7. The filmmaker behind the Happy Death Day films, Freaky, as well as most of the Paranormal Activity movies. Not much has been said on this yet. We don't even have a rough window of when it is supposed to be released. There's a rumor that Jenna Ortega will come back for one last film, but that her screen time will be greatly diminished this time around, which probably doesn't surprise anyone. But that is kind of a massive loss to the series, because out of all of our new cast members, the range that she has is pretty impressive, and she is far and away the one who's giving the best performance in these out of the new bunch. His film Freaky was unfortunately one of those works that got sacrificed for small amounts of money during the early months of the pandemic, and as a result, very few people actually saw it. But it ended up being one of my favorite pandemic era films. And I kind of hate that the conditions of its release killed the impact that it may have had. Because that movie was a blast. And was really indicative to me on what he could do with a Scream film. As tonally, they're quite similar. Which is probably one of the deciding factors of him getting the job there, just like Ready or Not was for Radio Silence. And as far as I'm concerned, Scream is in excellent hands that are poised to continue the franchise, and also again hopefully breathe a different, fresh air of life into its lungs. And I can't wait to see where they go with them. Ah, <gasps>